hello everyone. Uh, can you hear me behind there? Yeah. Yes. Oh, great. Yeah. Movie guy. <laughs> so, this is my talk about the future of app delivery, or what I view as the future of app delivery, and it will be with Docker and its containerization technology in general. So my name is Edward Charlie. I work as local as a software developer. I work with these wonderful people here. We are in the front end team. And so the first question might be why would a software coding monkey like me or even a lot of you guys be interested in the way your application is actually deployed? And um, well, for me, this whole talk actually just to rewind a bit is uh, kind of egoistic because. Um, I really like Docker, especially after I tried it a bit, and I essentially want all of you guys to like it a lot too, and I want you guys to hate what you have right now, which is probably similar to what we have, but I hope I'll succeed in that in the end, and then finally I can play with Docker in production very soon. Hopefully. So let's just rewind a bit and talk about the current state of what we have right now, and what most of us, well it's a strong guess, but what most of us use for application deployment. Currently, we have hardware we deploy to, or virtualized hardware. And what most of us do, well, most sensible people, I might say, use automation or some form of automation to replay all the things. So you record your actions that you uh, did to uh, provision to create the server, and you replay them with tools like Puppet or Chef or whatever. So obviously, I don't like that, but. So there are obviously a few great things about it right now too, so it's pretty scalable, I mean companies with huge infrastructure like Netflix, they have global infrastructure that I think relies on the public, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, they use it in a huge scale and when it works it's pretty great, I mean I haven't heard many things about that said. so what do I think bad about that? It's pretty rigid and it has a lot of moving parts. So. Has anyone ever had to change uh, Puppet configuration before? So a lot. Okay. Did you like it? You can say yes, it's fine. <laughs> and, yes. Yeah, okay, that's good. Good input there. And I forgot to ask, has anyone ever used Docker? Cool. Has anyone used it in production? No. I was hoping someone could help me. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> whatever. So, yeah, back to the uh, slide. Um, it's, I think it's rigid because changing things involves a lot of work and there are lots of moving parts, which I'd like to explain in the following way. Um, this would visualize a typical stack that we have. So, if you're working on Linux, you probably use a few core libraries like libc, libxml, stuff like that. On top of that, for us, we have a Rails stack, so of course we have gems. And if you don't know what gems are, that's the packaging. Ruby gems is the package system for Rails, essentially for Ruby. And then, of course, we have Rails. And after a while, every normal Ruby project uses more gems because you can never have enough gems, which have more dependencies. And then you need a web server. So essentially, that's pretty much it. And at some point, something goes wrong. And the worst point where it can go wrong is at the bottom, usually, because everything kind of has interdependencies on it, and we had this recent issue where we needed a specific version of curl, of libcurl, because the one that we had had a bug, and it was this huge back and forth, and at some point I thought it would be so great if we had Docker, because we wouldn't have all this mess, and if you mess with all of this after a while, usually it breaks, and when it breaks, it makes you really grumpy, and it really is a nightmare. So my personal experience as a developer has been, it's great when it works, it's a nightmare when it breaks, and that leads me to the conclusion to never touch it once I have it, have it running. I'd rather provision to a new server and do all of the new stuff there. So this is a status quo, it's terrible. And Docker, so how can Docker help, and what the hell is Docker in general anyway? So Docker is a container management tool and by container, I mean, you can really take that, just try and take that literally. So this is a really apt comparison to the, the shipping container revolutionized international shipping. 
and transportation in general because people didn't have to deal with baskets full of whatever fish and cars and Barbie dolls or whatever. You just have a container, you can stuff that on your ship and ship it out. You have a standardized set of dimensions you can deal with. And Docker aims to do exactly that for software. You can stuff all your dependencies in it and where it runs, those servers, they don't care what's in it. They just care about the container, which sounds really nice and it actually is. It really works. And a guy at eBay, I think, said this. He wants something that runs on his notebook, and I want something that runs on my notebook. I want something that runs on your notebooks. And this is solved right now. You can use Vagrant if you want. I mean, if you want to shove gigabytes around your network every time you do a change, it's okay. But uh, Docker helps you with this. What I think isn't solved sensibly right now is this. You can run something on your notebook, on your co-workers notebooks, and on your servers without changing anything. Which is really practical if you work on large teams with large deployments. <laughs> um, so it basically solves your dependency issues that you usually have. You, one person cares about it and everyone profits from it. And it's really, really fast. You'll see that in the demo later. It's insanely fast compared to what we have now. And how it works, <laughs> if you start looking into it, it really sounds like magic, and it kind of is. And I think you shouldn't care about it as a developer. But if you do care about it, it the reason it does it that fast is it doesn't have a guest operating system. So when you start Vagrant, it takes about two to three minutes uh, to start the virtual operating environment and all that stuff. And it uses really fancy, oh, it's, this stuff has been around for a while, but the Docker people took C groups, namespaces, AUFS, all these cool projects on their own right, and used Go <laughs> to wrap those things together to give you Docker. So if you're interested in looking in the insides of it, I highly suggest you Google that stuff because it's really fast. So I hope I didn't overload you with anything too much. Do um, you have any questions till now? Because the next thing would be a uh, live demo. Yeah. So, uh, we have an uh, internal debug. Sorry? You can't see anything. That's fantastic. Uh, have an internal uh, Docker server for development reasons. Uh, let's just connect to that. Can you read the font? Yeah, cool. Can I make it smaller? No, 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 okay. <laughs> Movie guy says no. <laughs> okay, let's look at the script then. So, um, for those of you who haven't seen Docker yet, it's very similar to general uh, virtualization technology. So, you have the notion of images, and this is a very useless list I see at this resolution, but essentially what you get is you can download pre-existing images from a service that Docker provides, which you can find at index.docker.io. It's kind of a cool service, they, it's searchable, and anyone can push to it, you can namespace stuff, and you can see on the left hand side here they have the popular images, which are the base images most people use to build their stuff upon. So what we can do, what usually most people do is let's just go and get the base image. So docker has a command pull, so just pull the base image, and this will just download all the layers necessary, I hope this works, live demo time, uh, to build that image. I've already downloaded that thing, of course, so we can just run off of that. So once I've downloaded it, let's just check if I actually have that image. Yeah, I have it multiple times. 
So I have it already here. So I can run stuff in a Docker uh, image. And just as a short explanation, I didn't go too in deep into that just now. What you want to do with Docker is you want to wrap processes in containers. So everything a process needs, like this for example, Docker run, let's take the base image. Uh, yeah. So what I want to do is I run to one echo and just output text. And what Docker will do is wrap everything I specified in the base image around that, execute the command and output that back to me. So if I do that, I get hello world back. So this isn't too spectacular, I mean, it just says hello world, but the implications of what it just did is, are very important, I feel. So let's just add time before that. And when you look at the time it took, that's less than a half a second to create a, uh, a root file system, boot up everything it needs to run Echo, add a network stack, map ports, execute your command, put it back out to you, and shut down again in less than half a second. In Vagrant, we would still be talking and waiting and fiddling our thumbs. So that's the base of what's awesome of Docker is actually the timing. That really is totally crazy. So, what? <laughs> uh, now let's do something more involved. What might be more familiar to you guys is running an interactive terminal, because when you boot Vagrant, you have a terminal, a shell, and all that stuff. So uh, let's do that. You can run Docker with flags, so interactive minus i and get a TTY from it. Tell it to use the base image again, and as I said, you wrap com you wrap processes in Docker, so you always that's just the way it is right now. But you always pass a command to Docker. So let's just run bash, and ta-da! I have a shell. And if uh, if I want to use this now, let's just do the simple version without going too deep into it, I can install stuff if I want. So, how about... Uh, let's just install Nginx. So, update first, please be fast. It will come. It will do it. Yes, oh, great. So let's install Nginx. Quickly, yeah. So let's go, and then we can do start nginx to start nginx, and it doesn't know it. All the way around. Sorry. Just oh, cool. Sorry. Ah, uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> so nginx is actually running, and we can do local hosts, and I don't have code. <laughs> Great. So let's just stop here and exit out of it again and note this number here, this weird string, whatever. So what I just did is I wrapped, I, I started an instance in Docker, a container in Docker, did something and went out of it again. The issue now is Docker stopped that after I exited it. So if I do Docker PS, it's gone. What's running here is this our, another process that you can ignore. And um, let me just kill that. So yeah, nothing's running. But what Docker provides is an interface to actually see the past commands that I ran, and that was this right here. And again, the same number it showed me in the shell. So what Docker does is, any anytime you execute an instance, it generates a possible diff hash. So I can reference that later. So what I can do now is, I can actually commit the change. So the change I did was uh, install nginx, and I want to keep that. So let's do Docker commit. That's the hash that I pulled from that. And let's give it a name, uh, web Tuesday nginx. There we go. Now I do Docker images. I have a new image <coughs> with that. And note the size of the image is pretty small. And the reason that is is because AUFS, it's a 
union file system that Docker use, uses, so it only saves changes. It's like it's a bit like GIF, GIT. It, sa it, it saves diffs to what you did. So what I can do now is Docker run again. I want an interactive shell, and this time I want to map a port. Another cool feature. I want to map port 8080 from the host to 80 on the in the Docker container, and then the Docker container is called now Web Tuesday. That's the new one we just made and bin bash. I'm in it again. Nginx this time, start. So the difference now is I didn't have to install it, it's there already, and I did the port mapping magic. So if I go to the server, hey, it worked, Nginx. Uh, if there aren't any more questions, I'd like to carry on to show you what I actually promised. <laughs> which is showing how to do it with Rails and MongoDB. Do you know the hypervisor it uses? Uh, it doesn't use a hypervisor. <laughs> Look, I, I, um, the cool thing is here. Um, can I see? Oh, shit. Uh, wait. I can do that. Let me change the You see it's still running, right? If I do... This is actually the host that I'm showing the processes on. It actually runs on the host. It doesn't run in a virtual environment. It, it, it's like lying to your process and telling it, hey, you have all this stuff, but actually you don't. And like, I'm not going to switch back to the magic slide, but read into it, it's kind of involved if you really want to understand what's going on. I mean, for me it was... Jail on steroids, I would say. Yeah, but it, it goes really isolation. farther than that. It has so much stuff in it that it's just too painful yeah. to handle yourself, and that's why they go talk. So yeah, just to be uh, quick about it, let's just exit this again. And to build uh, an actual environment you want to use and that is re reproducible, uh, you want to use Docker files, but I suggest you use Docker files. And what Docker files are is a uh, is a way to, uh, to to produce something similar to what Puppet does. So you have reproducible results. So what you can do is you can build. It's hard to read, but I'm just going to fly over it. All the commands like uh, apt install and all of that, you can write it to a file, and it's basically a, a shell script. It isn't it? You don't have to learn any weird DSL for it. You can, like this is for the locomotive install that Thomas will use later. It's just a bunch of stuff that you really don't want to care about. A uh, bunch of libraries. We install Ruby. We <coughs> use RVM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We expose ports. And all of this can be run to build an image like which it just did just now, just in an automated manner. And what you get with that is a really complicated image which can be used to build more complicated stuff, and it's actually fun to do it, and you won't pull out your hair. The only non-fun part right now is running this stuff, because Docker isn't production ready yet, so stuff like POSIX, POSIX compliant exit codes, and there was, there was a lot of hacker involved to get to what I have now. Let me just... Yeah, nothing's running. So essentially what it is, I use supervisor. It's a process supervisor thing where you can tell it, run this process, observe it, when it <coughs> fails, restart it again. So I built my incantations for Docker and made this <coughs> thing run them for me. So what I can do now is run my Docker container from Mongo, let it start, it's running, I mean, it's gonna get bigger. And do the same for the Rails application container. And what we have now is if I go to the same thing on port 80, will be hopefully a Rails app that runs in Docker, which connects to a MongoDB application that runs in Docker as well. Do you have a separate image for these two? For yes. DB and oh. Yeah, actually, Sasha asked me that why the hell would I do that? Uh, <laughs> Essentially, the cool, what you get from Docker is 
you, you have a separation of concerns to the extreme. And if you stuff all of that into one image, I want one container, you lose that flexibility. You can't have a specific version of libc for each. And if that is an issue you have. Oh, it worked. Well, for more. Yeah, it's taking VPN isn't what it is, what I hope it is, but yeah. There we go, locomotive, it actually worked. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let me switch back to my slides. Great. <laughs> Great. So yeah, that was my live demo. We built a semi-production ready environment <laughs> for Rails and MongoDB in Docker. It works, it's repeatable, it runs, and it was a lot of fun doing it. And that was it. So do you have any questions? <laughs> yes. So what would you say you said it's not production ready? But I mean the production readiness is maybe very important if you re replicate this on servers, <laughs> but for development environments, yeah. the the, re the main what the first the couple of reasons the main one is it's annoying as hell. You have to just, you have to walk through you walk into so many issues that Docker has right now because when you look at it and you oh. use it the first oh. time, it's so strong. Like the they, they they deploy this minimum viable product which has this incredible functionality, but there are lots of bits and pieces that you expect to work and they don't, they're just not there yet. And they had this huge momentum, and stuff just takes time. And we're in the stuff just takes time phase. Mm -hmm. So it's that, that, that's one of the things you have to read a lot of annoying <coughs> issues and pull requests on GitHub to get what you want. And uh, honestly, there are limitations on the technology they use, like AUFS. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the amount of layers that you can stack is limited to 46. So. Yeah, you're screwed at some points. <laughs> so either they're moving away from that, but it just takes time. It will take a couple of months to they remove all those deficiencies. Sorry. Uh, they're called Docker Inc. now, but they used to be the dot cloud people. They're a platform as a service service. <laughs> yeah. Does it replace things like Salt Stack, Puppet Chef? So, like, they are totally irrelevant now with this. I don't know. I it kind of feels like it could be like our systems people say, no way, we're gonna use Docker is going to be in OpenStack and it's going to be fine. And I'm like, who cares? But it's it depends who you ask, I guess. Because you can build Docker files with Puppet and because Docker files they look rather procedural to me. What I like about SaltStack it's very declarative. I say I want this, this, and this, and I don't care if it's there or not. It will be in the proper state. So what happens if I have a running application with data, with some system libraries it relies on, and then I change stuff, and I want to push a new release? How do I do this with yeah, Docker? Yeah, that's one of the production ready issues right there. But what you can do now is you run up a new instance and do some load balancing magic and switch it over to that. Okay, so just throw away, thoughts. put, replace with a yeah. new one. It's, it's really cheap. I mean, mm. you can run hundreds of instances. That's I didn't show that, but you can just mm. spin up like a lot of stuff on a simple laptop, but uh, you don't have hot swapping capabilities right now. So if you have like, uh, for example, Nginx, you, you build a virtual host and you build another one, another one, and, you know, yeah. like, on top of it now I have a fairly complex virtual host template, just a bunch of like options in right It usually is. And <laughs> So yeah, I don't know exactly how that would map to, to Docker. Like, do you end up with, with one script copy pasted for each, or you have a base image instead of nginx and some stuff like? I, I I was looking into it exactly that. But you want to build complex like 
uh, Docker files based off each other. And what you can do is you can include stuff, you can include scripts. So just it really is kind of just a shell scripting. Mm -hmm. So you can do everything within the, most of the things within the confines of shell scripts. But yeah, it's that's that's one of the issues there. It's not there yet, but it will be, and I hope it will. Be. I really do. So you would still have a lot of duplication. At this point, probably, yeah. That's why our systems people are so keen on getting open stack and that and solving that problem like that way. Yeah. Any other questions? What, what was the closest comparison you met to Babel? Was that, was that the uh, closest comparison technology wise, I think, would be Zen. In the way, like, it's, just, it's like a step further than Zen. It like, doesn't care about anything anymore. It just fakes stuff and lets the process run. Zen is quite close to that, but not completely that, and you know, our own virtualization stuff, but it's just a step further down the chain of letting the host system do most of the heavy lifting. Yeah. So Vagrant was too big. Well, no, sorry about Vagrant, but Vagrant is VirtualBox, and the VirtualBox is exactly the other side of the spectrum. It actually boots a guest operating system, and boots a network stack, and all of that, and you have a virtual <coughs> system. With Docker, you don't. You have the bits and pieces cobbled together, that the minimum amount that you need to get something running. And it, the, the whole way the AUFS works, it actually clones the root file system of the host. And any write produces a copy. That's why you get this. So it's, it's, actually, it's actually a process running on the host. But for, for the production deployment, how does it work? Because I don't want to run all my worker nodes on a single hardware node, yes, right? Exactly. So how, how do you can, be? Yeah, what you can do is, um, I'm currently working on that actually. Uh, Docker has, you saw the Docker index, right? That's a front end for the Docker registry. And that's like aptitude for uh, Docker. And it's a really annoying Python script right now. And <laughs> that's why I asked you guys about Python. And uh, what you can do is you can host that yourself in your local network, and you can do pull from my private repository slash nginx thing that I just built. And if you have scripts like provisioners that <coughs> know that they can, you can just pull stuff from your local repository and deploy it like that. You don't have to have everything duplicated. How do you do service discovery? Uh, Georg Kunz is looking at that right now. No, that's it's a it's it's that doesn't exist in that form. The the release that oh, came out this weekend. Yeah, and the release. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but if you look into it, it's really wonky. It's like that the last release is like, why did you do that? It's not helping me at all. And yeah, it, it, that's why I say it just takes a while and everyone's expecting way too much from them, but me too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the question to what is, is it closer? Um, does it use LXC? Yes. Okay. It's on the, on on the other side, it's Alex's Linux containers for mm -hmm. uninitiated. And they've, everything that they use has been around for a while, except Go, which has been around for a while. For four years? Four years, four years. Yeah, four years. And everything else is quite old. So the BSD guys will be like, yeah, it's been around. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's Linux containers. And that's was, it's a lot to handle if you don't have Docker. Uh, yeah. While working at Finance for yeah. One of the big problems is that if you want to run just a process, you need a VM. Mm -hmm. If you need a VM, you need a host name. And just to get a host name, sometimes you can take weeks. <laughs> 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 so that's, you know, that's a good <laughs> professionality for that. You know? Yeah, and it, yeah, it, it, does, it has its own assigning for IP, yeah. so when you run an instance, it actually generates a local yeah, no, IP. But for eventually an asset management perspective. Yeah. See, they, they, they live too short, so you yeah. can spin one up, do something, and it's gone already. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the audit is not like Yes? Are we good? Oh. Thanks a lot.